Hi, I'm Robert. And I'm Evelyn. And this is Token About It. Before we get into this episode, uh, we just finished our very first Q&A with our patrons. All right. Yay. <laughs> anyway, uh, it actually was a lot of fun. We got some really interesting questions. There was a couple questions we couldn't get to, so we definitely want to do it again. That way uh, we can talk a little bit more in depth about some of the stuff that we were talking about. But it was a lot of fun. Yeah, and uh, let me quickly answer the ones that we didn't get to. Yes, yes, no, maybe, I don't know. There you go. <laughs> I think it was a little bit more in depth than that. Yeah, it was. Uh, which is why we had to stop, because someone had to go to bed, which, honestly, same. <laughs> Okie dokie. So, um, do we have anything else before getting into this chapter? Um, I don't think so. Okay, so what is this chapter? This is Passage of the Marshes. Okay, and I had predictions. Yes, you have predictions. And What were your predictions, my dear? So my predictions were kind of scattered for this one because one was, one was a two-parter. So the first prediction was that the whole, like, potato thing that's in the movie, <clears throat> that's the meme, was not going to be in the book. Um, but I said, but if it was in the book, it would be this chapter. Was, like, kind of my two-parter. Yep. So. You're wrong. Am I? About being in this chapter. About being in this chapter, yeah. But I said, if it's if it's anywhere, it'll be this chapter. And if it's not in the chapter, it's not going to be in the book at all. That's what I said. We'll have to figure that out, won't we? We will. Okay. So that's going to be our my next current long-standing prediction. Um, And then... I also predicted that we were going to see a monster or and or creature that we have not seen before. And when we come to that, um, I'm going to um, argue that I should get a half a point. Mm, and I can already tell you no. I'm going to argue for a half a point. Okay. Um, and then my third prediction was, oh my gosh, what was it? I, sh I keep not writing these down. Oh, well. It was probably wrong anyway. Why don't you write these things down? I thought I did, but then I forgot. I need to, I know, I need to You keep need to it. see my disgust and disappointment in my face right now. You mean constantly when I'm talking to you? No, no, no. Just <laughs> when you do shit like this. Oh. No, no. Just when you do stuff like this. <laughs> okay well we can definitely go ahead and get into the chapter then and we'll i'll argue my point later okay when we get there so well we left the previous chapter with schmiegel um promising to behave yes oh that was it wasn't i just remembered it wasn't a prediction it was like a thing for me to figure out my prediction was by the end of this chapter, I would figure out the difference between Smeagol and Gollum. Oh, okay. It was more of that. Okay, gotcha. So we'll see if I do, because yep. I'm honestly still not confident. Yep. <laughs> okay. Like I said, so we left the previous chapter with Smeagol promising to behave. Yes. Uh, and even, when it, even the first time in this chapter, when it seems like he has an opportunity to leave, um, but he ends up waiting for them to catch up. Yes. Yeah. I noticed that when, um, cause part of me was expecting Gollum to just kind of like sprint and just go and not care if they like don't make it or not. So I was actually surprised to see that he did turn around and wait for them. That did surprise me. Yeah. And, um, and we get, information from the book that he's basically following the way he went before right um where he hid from um the orcs and other nasties right and i i'm but i also find it interesting here that he's calling himself schmiegel yes yeah i mean he's talking in third person but still you know schmiegel be good boy um, yeah, exactly. And which at that's this... That's what we're going to name our next dog. Schmeagol? Schmeagol. No. 
And we'll call him Schmeedy, Schmeedy for short. I mean, if you get a dog, you can do that. <laughs> My next dog's not going to be that. Ooh, that's a better name for a cat, actually. Maybe. Okay, so get another cat. I dare you. No. <laughs> Goose needs a friend to torture. Meanwhile, back at the ranch. Um, so... Schmeagle. Schmeagle, yeah. So at this point, I'm thinking Schmeagle's kind of the... It, it's Schmeagol versus Gollum, where Gollum is the one who is completely possessed by this ring, and Schmeagol is the one that still has, like, some semblance of good and potentially redemption, is kind of where I'm at at this part of the chapter. And I say that because the next there is a part that did throw me off and I wanted to ask about when we get there. Sounds yeah, good. Okay. And, like I said, so, I, I, you know, it's interesting that he's calling himself Schmeagol at this time. Mm -hmm. And, but we don't get that far into this chapter where we don't see some of Gollum popping up right. again. Um, so, this chapter has a song. It does. And it's sung by Gollum. I swear, if you start singing it in Gollum's voice, I quit the podcast. <laughs> I didn't even think about doing that. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for the, thanks for the. Thanks for the I, uh, I idea. will rage quit. <laughs> <laughs> but it is an interesting song. It, it it's go ahead and sing it first. We'll, well, I know. Talk about so it. it says sometimes even croaking a song. I can't really sing. I cannot sing in that voice. Thank God. I mean, I can't sing in my own voice either. But uh, I mean, that's fair. Neither can I, though. I I have you can't no sing in my voice. All right, so the cold, hard lands, they bite our hands, they gnaw our feet. The rocks and stones are like old bones, all bare of meat. The stream and pool is wet and cool, so nice for feet, and now we wish. And he's, and he's like, ha, 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 what do we wish for? And then he continues on. Alive without breath, as cold as death, never thirsting, ever drinking, clad in mail, never clinking. Drowns on dry land, thinks an island is a mountain, thinks a fountain is a puff of air, so sleek, so fair. What a joy to meet, we only wish to catch a fish so juicy sweet. So part of this song has one of the riddles that he asked Bilbo. Yes, that and he even mentions that. He's just like, Bilbo got it, can you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's and it's to me, it was almost haunting and right. i wonder if he was like and it seemed like it was like directed at sam like he really hates sam <laughs> yeah, he, well, oh my god it's a mutual hate society it is it really is but what's it thing here though sam is so obsessed with keeping an eye on Gollum, with gall not wanting Gollum to even really be there that uh he, he fails and that he fails to think about food. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and it's not until... They start to get hungry that they're like, oh no. Well, it's not even not until um, Gollum mentions it. Yeah, he's like, no, uh, I mean, is he going to eat us? Well, no, but he's like, we have, lim we have Limbus. Yeah. But, but this is not going to last. Right. I mean, he says, you know, somewhere in there he says, you know, if we're really careful, we have three weeks. Here. Yeah. And he's wondering uh, what they would do when, yeah. when they run out. So they're like, they're expecting a really long journey. Right. You know, they decide to hide while the sun is up. And this is due to Gollum's advice, and they listen and take heed of that. Uh, Frodo offers Limbus to Gollum, which I think we, you know, before we read this, we can guess what. Yeah, I, I immediately was just like, this is going to be the same as the elf route. Yeah. 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 And so, you know, he recognizes the leaf immediately. Right. That this is a leaf from the woods of the elves. Which he did not like. He does not like. And now, and also he doesn't, he doesn't like the taste. Yeah. You try to chokes me. Yeah. Yep. 
And but this causes Sam to think more <laughs> highly of the Limbus because Gollum doesn't like it. Yeah, he's just like, this is okay. This is I like this now. Yeah. This is nice. Yeah. And he doesn't like it, so I do. Ha ha ha. So after they eat, you know, they decide to sleep. Right. And Sam's idea is that he says sleep in pairs. But that doesn't make sense on the face. Then you have to realize he's talking about, we'll let Gollum sleep the whole time, but me and Frodo have to we'll switch back turn. and forth. Yeah. Both of us should not be asleep around him. Right. And so Sam takes first watch. And when he sees what he thinks is Gollum being asleep, he, he wants to check it out. Yeah, so first he like pokes him. Yeah, he pokes him. And then he gets right in his ear and go, Vicious. Yeah, that was. <laughs> I mean, yes, but also it was kind of weird. I'm just, I imagine like someone whispering it in my ear. I'm like, that's not comfortable. That's <laughs> <laughs> what I imagined when that happened. Um, but yeah, so Gollum seemingly is definitely asleep. So he kind of nods off a little bit without waking Frodo. Right. Um, but be, you know, but before that, you know, you know, Sam is thinking about you know I should. I mean, he, this isn't how it's written in the book. But Sam is kind of thinking I should just go ahead and slit, slit his throat now. Yeah, he thinks that several times when Gollum's asleep, and it's like, again, honestly, same. I get that Gollum serves a purpose, but I'm with Sam on this one, where it's just like I, I don't trust him. I just, I really don't. I don't trust him as far as I can throw him, and I'm very weak. But, but Sam, but here Sam sees that he would be more like Gollum if he decided to take Gollum's life. Yeah, that's true. So. Well, see, but I would disagree with that. Well, and, and as Evelyn said, Sam falls asleep, and uh, when they wake up, um, Gollum's gone. Right. But he did no harm to the hobbits, which yeah. kind of surprises Sam. Yeah, Sam's really surprised. And honestly, I'm a little surprised. Like, I was totally expecting them to wake up to find him, like, over them. Even if just creepily watching them. Like, the fact that he was just gone was surprising to me because I didn't think he would want to keep, or I thought he would want to keep Frodo very much in his sights. Especially, like, because he's the ring bearer. Right. Now, uh, but we also have, you know, Frodo is accepting the idea. This is a little ways along. Yeah. We get a lot of details um, and descriptions and stuff, but right now I don't want to spoil that if somebody is reading, reading, along. reading along. And so Frodo is accepting... Or the idea, oh, well, you know, I say I don't want to spoil that, but now I'm getting ready to really give you a big spoil. Um, um, Frodo is accepting the idea he would most likely die once they, quote, do yes. the job. Yeah, I did get that vibe. Yeah. He He's very much resigned to it. Right. And even though it's something that obviously he doesn't want to do, it's something that he will do. And to me, that that kind of shows Frodo's bravery a little bit more to me, where Frodo is very much, he's definitely a martyr in a sense, but not the, like, annoying type martyr, more of the, like, well, this is going to happen, so might as well get used to it kind of thing. Right. He's not the one, um, like, like, just talking about it constantly to everyone. <laughs> which is like a trope that I find annoying, but um, he's just like, he's just keeping it to himself. He's just like, okay, this is going to happen. Let's move along. Right. And then... Which is very British, I think. Right, and, and Sam... From the British people I know. <laughs> and Sam shows a a sign of obedience here, which... It, yes. Yes, it's, you know, it's, it's interesting. It was definitely... It was... Okay, so t say what happens and then we'll discuss it. You say what happens. Okay, so at one point, Sam 
um, is just, he's a little upset that he's lost Gollum again, and Gollum has disappeared, and that things are just going real crazy. And Sam is kind of, I guess, thinking about Frodo and his potential situation as well. And so he uh, takes a knee and he takes Frodo's hand. And even though he doesn't kiss it, he like he cries and like a couple tears fall on it. Yep. And this, which I felt was sim- more meaningful than kissing the hand. So do I. Yeah. And it's something where to me it was he was resigned to uh, to go with Frodo. And if he meets a bad end as well, then so be it. And it was definitely. Through the lens of Tolkien's time, it really goes back to what we keep saying, which is that it's like that lieutenant and his valet, where they're they're friends, but there's definitely a hierarchy, um, and it's a servitude, but a willing servitude. Um, I guess is not, I guess that's not the way I want to describe it. Um, it it's more. I don't know how to describe it. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, and that's I think that's part of like the problem of looking at it through a modern lens is it is something that we don't see in a modern era a lot, or at least not in Western American culture um, that we are looking at it through. Well, okay, so I'm going to give you a really interesting take on where we see something like this. Okay. The Simpsons. Okay. Mr. Burns. Oh, and Smithers. and Smithers. No, that's different because Smithers is gay for Burns. But also, though, he, I mean, he's... Well, he's just, well, he's gay in general, but he's, like, in love with Mr. Burns. Right. But that's kind of, like, where he, I mean, he ended up that way after being such a selfless servant to Burns. True. He is a very selfless ser- uh, servant to Burns. And there are times in The Simpsons where you do see, like, a friendship forming. Right. And I guess that is the most relevant form. I still think it doesn't quite fit. Yeah, it doesn't quite fit, but but it's something the closest I can think of. Yeah, at least, again, from our American culture. Our American culture. Yeah, so actually, that's something that we would like to hear y'all's take on if... If you guys, I know we have some international listeners. If you guys know another thing that um, is similar in a modern era, that would be really interesting for us to uh, learn about and to read about. Um, or if you had like a better way of describing it, we would like to hear that too. Right. And and you know, Evelyn said something in the modern world today, mm-hmm. current culture. But maybe those who are international listeners might have. Some completely historic ways. Yeah. You know, completely different historic ways um, that that was shown, too, you know, according to their culture. And I would like to hear about that, too. Yeah. Because, again, the only thing I can think of historically is that uh, that World War One type of mm-hmm. one. That's really the only one I can really think of. Right. Which is exactly what this is. You know what? Sherlock and Watson. I can kind of see that. Yeah. Yeah. You see that Watson technically works for Sherlock. um, Right. And is, like, considered, like, a secondhand man kind of deal. But they're also friends at the same time, but Watson would do anything to save Sherlock. Right, especially in the form of the TV show of um, Cumberbatch. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the Sherlock, the BBC, but also Elementary. With Lucy Liu. But she was a little more independent. She, she was a little bit more independent, but still, at this, she started out as working, well, technically working for his dad um, and working for him as well. Um, but then they became friends, and even though she still defers to him and has a little bit, um, and she has a little bit more independence, um, it's still very similar. Right. So, I believe that's our second rabbit hole so far. But this was a good rabbit this hole. This was a good rabbit hole. Yeah, this it was trying has, to put it in context. Actually had, yeah, context of trying to figure this out in our time. Yeah. But, you know, there's something else I found really interesting. Is that when Gollum, you know, eats the fish and so forth. Mm-hmm. He gets in the water and washes himself. Yes. So, I'm wondering if... You know, 
if that's because he's around the hobbits and it reminds of his reminds him of his own way. Yeah. Because yeah, we don't really see him. Older, yeah. Because in the Hobbit, the book, and then as well as obviously early, even though this is like really our first time truly seeing him, we haven't really seen him wash himself. Though have we gotten, I'm trying to remember, have we gotten like any reference that he's like, he stinks or gross or stuff? I mean, obviously he stinks and he's gross, but, <laughs> or at least from my like small memories of being terrified of him. But other than that, well, I mean, maybe it's just a the, habit that he that is left over from when before the ring. Maybe it's just a habit that he's kept over the years. I I think it would have been mentioned somehow before. You know, I mean, even if it was something like he washed his face or okay, I mean, because even when he puts his feet in the water, it's because it cools his feet, not because he's trying to wash his feet. Oh, that's true. Yeah, and and so I. Yeah, I, I like to think that's because since he's around these hobbits, it reminds him of the old way. I dig it. I can go with it. And then, you know, again, we have another. I'm not going to read I I highlighted it to read it. I'm not going to read it. But, um, the we can folk, still talk about the it. The folks read it. Uh, but another description of what's happening. Yes. I have been loving the descriptions in this book. It's... Again, it's very lengthy, and Tolkien really knows how to drive a point home <laughs> a little too well. But it's done just so well where you... <coughs> mm, suddenly just got a stuck in my throat. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, I loved the descriptions and how it really brings you to the situation. It really brought me there. Like, I was, when I was reading it, like, the dog was on my lap, and I forgot the dog was on my lap until he, like, sneezed. Because <laughs> I was just <laughs> so in the book. <laughs> and then, you know, and, and so, and then after this passage, you know, like, you get the hobbits were now wholly in the hands of Gollum. So, yeah. they have kind of released their... Their hold of him. Their hold of him. They're trusting him a little bit. I mean, as they're they're trusting him because they have to. It's well, a necessity. Yeah, it's yeah, it's and it's like all right, we're gonna die anyway. Let's do this. Let's go. Right, but I I don't I still don't see it so much. Maybe on Frodo's part of the trust, but on Sam's part, I think he's like you know, he's. Get between a rock and a hard place type of thing. Mm -hmm. No, I think for Frodo too. I think Frodo is stuck between a rock and a hard place as well, but he has a little bit more let's try to squeeze through attitude versus Sam's just like, uh-oh. And then eventually we, get, we reach the ancient battlefield and um, they actually hardly take note of that. I mean, but this is... You know, this is the old, old battlefield where yeah. three major battles have taken place, including the one where Sauron was... Yeah. I don't even want to say... Because he wasn't defeated. But where they... But driven took back. Away, took, away, took away a bunch of his power. Yeah. And that's... I had a question at this part. They keep mentioning these lights... And I was wondering if we had any more background information on what these lights are, because for me, it came off of a, um, I, I don't know if Tolkien would have known this, but there is a Japanese creature that is basically a, um, a hopping lantern. Um, if you've seen the movie um, Spirited Away, um, you would have seen a version of this creature where um, there's multiple creatures in different mythologies where they have these lights where they try to lure people into bogs to kill them and eat them. Well, and that's kind of the vibe I got because there are some in English um, mis uh, mythology as well. I just can't remember their names. Will the Wisp. Will the Wisp. Um, they're not 
quite as malicious as this came off. Right. Well, this came off as like potentially malicious. Well, Will I, the wisps are just like see, mischievous. I and I don't see it coming off as malicious because um, Gollum calls them candles of corpses. And candles of corpses is a flame that you know, even, you know, even in our times, people believe if they see this flame in a graveyard or a churchyard, it's a bad omen. Right. So it's not that it's going to harm you. It's just a bad omen. It's, a okay. bad o- it's just a bad omen. Okay, which uh, again, not saying like the will of the wisps. There is one like it. I just, I honestly cannot yeah. remember off the top of my head, which is, I'm disappointing myself. And when Sam falls, the light tends to get more ominous around him. Um... And then he can clearly see the faces in the water at that time, too. This was creepy to me. This was so interesting. And the way that um, Gollum was describing it, where they're, where they're asking him, it's like, is this some sort of dark magic? And he's just like, I don't know, but it's creepy to me. And if it's creepy to Gollum, it's a pretty freaking <laughs> creepy. Right. Like, Well, and also what's <laughs> interesting here, too, is the events that took place here was so long ago that he doesn't have a memory of it. Right. Uh, so this, so the, basically the faces are the faces of people who died. Yes. And how they got corrupted and put into this watery scene is over the years, hundreds of years, this water has expanded itself into the graves yeah. of the people who have died. Right. And yeah, but it is. It's it's very it's very creepy. I mean, you you can't see through the water, and all of and a sudden it's, like they, it's clear as a window, and you can see faces. Right, and they even um, they say at one point they're rotting, and it's like that sounds awful. Like I would definitely vomit. I, just straight up, I would have vomited. So I want to. I have another rabbit hole to go down. Okay, okay. let's well, go. Well, so. Gollum thinks that the three of them are on their way to see Saruman. Which, I mean, kind of they are. No, they're not They're not planning on face-to-face him. Yeah. I mean, that, that's what Gollum is thinking. Oh, that's true. Yeah, they're not... Okay. They're, they're headed in the same direction, but Gollum... So Gollum... Wait, so Gollum actually thinks... Okay, I must have missed this. So he really thinks that Frodo and Sam are just going to walk up to Sauron... And do what? What is I like? I'm just purely curious. What in the world does he think? Okay, because he thinks what he would do. Uh huh. Okay. Well, because this is what he thinks he would do himself if he yeah, but, had the power. Right, but why would they do any differently? Deliver the ring to Sauron, and gain a gift of power. Okay. All right. That's you know that's kind of where I see. Okay. Gollum's okay. Mind at. All right, I can I can see where that okay, cool, cool. Now, that makes more sense because that makes sense in context where later or, or it might be around here. Oh yeah, it is a little bit later where he kind of mentions it's just like what if I was the great golem kind of thing. So yeah. that makes that part make a little bit more sense to me. Okay, cool. Right. Well, and so the rabbit hole I want to go down. I've had this kind of on the side where we can where I can push it in here, but you know. Right here, uh, you know, so Sauron is not his real name. Mm-hmm. Sauron is what his enemies call him. Right. It means abomination or the putrid one. I mean, yeah. Okay. okay. His actual name is um, Meron, or Meriron, which means amorable. Because uh, wasn't he himself corrupted? Well, he... Well, he by pure evil, yeah. and and himself basically. Yeah. Um, but he was one of the uh, primordial spirits that helped mm-hmm. shape the world. Okay. And then I don't want to. I mean, that's almost a whole bonus episode. But getting into where he, where he starts to turn away from the rest of them. Mm-hmm. is seeing that he's not even being praised for helping create this place. Mm. And that 
that's the beginning. That's the first baby step towards where he ends up. So pride. Yeah. So yeah. So pride. Pr- pride. That's the downfall. Right. Pride. Then because of pride, he seeks power so he can destroy the others. Okay. Revenge. Yeah. You, and I you mean, didn't return my text. <laughs> but I mean, that makes sense for Tolkien because coming from a Catholic family or half of my family, like a saying that I hear all the time from the Catholic side of my family is um, pride is the greatest of the seven deadly sins. And this, I feel like that's a saying that Tolkien would know because of being Catholic. And I think that that holds true here where pride really is the greatest of the seven deadly sins. Well, pride it's, goes before the man who falls. Exactly. That's what I, yeah, yeah, that's what I said earlier. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's something that is very prevalent in religion as a whole, but also the Catholic religion. And right. so that would, that really makes sense in the context of this character. And, and so, you know, here again, after Gollum thinks that they're going to see Sauron, mm-hmm. okay, which we can already see the wheels turning in his head, how he might be able to get the ring before it gets to see him. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, but uh, Gollum tells them that Sauron's eye is looking their way. So they need to be very careful. Yes. Um, and the route they're taking is the route that Gollum took before. Uh, yeah, yeah. This was the easiest path he was able to find mm-hmm. you know, when he was there before. Yeah. Um, and when he was captured. Right. And also here, Frodo is really getting weary. Yes. And he tends to fall behind a lot. And I really want to make the Horcrux reference here. I know, I know. The Horcrux came later. But to put it in context for other people that may be Harry Potter fans who are reading along with this, it is the it is very much the same. And you know, Rowling like took it from here, where in the Horcruxes, especially when they're wearing the necklace, they are much more moody. They're much more exhausted. They can't even their magic is even weaker in Harry Potter, and. Here, we see that with Frodo. And so that's just what I would relate it to for people that haven't read it before. Okay. Uh, so, and, and, and that's the Harry Potter reference for the day. Good. <laughs> there may be more. So I find it interesting that Gollum also sees the sun as <laughs> being female. Yeah, well, not only that, but it's like, he doesn't even call it the sun. He calls it the big yellow face. The big yellow face, and he calls and the I moon the white that. face. White face, yeah. I thought that was so interesting. But, you know, but what <laughs> I find interesting, too, is that, you know, that um, the elves and the hobbits see it as a female. Mm-hmm. Where I I couldn't find it, and I might be wrong, but, you know, but the orcs don't. Hmm. Um the orcs, the orcs see them as a masculine enemy. Interesting. Because that's really interesting that... Because I'm really curious what made Tolkien decide to classify the sun as female because in... Because we know that in... That he's really into, like, Norse and Greek mythology and in both of those, the sun is very masculine in those uh, mythologies and the mythos there. So I find it really interesting that Tolkien decided to have it be viewed as a female. Well, but if you also think about it, for elves and hobbits, the sun is a helpful thing. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I know in uh, the in one of the Japanese religions, um, the goddess of the the sun is a goddess. And I'm not even going to try to pronounce her name because I know I will butcher it starts with an H and that's all I'll, that's all I can say because I don't want to butcher that name but um, I know that's the only thing that I can think of in that is also female yep. and, with the sun and so there are you know so in Tolkien's world there are a couple of different names for the sun um, one is 
Einar, which is the fire golden, and then Fasa, which is the heart of fire. So I think maybe even those names convey to us you know, a feminine trait. Okay. You know, um, like a, the bearer of flame, not necessarily the user of flame type of thing. Okay. And, and so, you know, getting back to the lights, the corpse lights, mm -hmm. the corpse candles, uh, Frodo gets lost in thought watching them. And um, Sam, either trying to watch the lights or trying to keep an eye on Frodo, uh, when he falls, it seems like the lights suddenly get more ominous. Yes. Um, so, you know, we talked a little bit about these lights already. But, you know, this is a, these lights are around what was the graves from the battlefield, uh, from the Battle of the Gorlad, which is the battle that takes place at the end of the second page. Okay. Um, and it literally means, the word literally means the battle plane. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, especially since we know and hope, uh, Tolkien has told us in his world at least three major battles have taken place there. Yes, yeah. And it's almost as if the place was destined for battles. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. it's been, yeah, that's, good, that's good observation. I, I didn't think of that so much. Um, but so Schmeagol then starts to smell a change coming. Yeah. And what this change ends up bringing is a Nazgul. Yes. Who seems to be actively looking for something. Yeah. Because he goes out and and circles around and goes back. Yeah, and Gollum freaks out. And that's when we, in the books, officially have the confirmation that they can that they have something that they can be in the air with. No, it's not the first time. Oh, yeah, that's right. Well, it's the first time that we that it's confirmed as a wraith on something. Because before they see something, it's never named. I don't think that's right. We'll have to go back and check. We'll have to go back because for me, I didn't think it was named in the last chapter. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I think they just saw something. It wasn't actually named. This is, it, as far as I can recall, this is the first time it's like, a, like, officially confirmed. So yeah, as you said, though, Gollum is afraid. Yeah. Um, he, you know, and from this point on in this chapter. Smeagol seems to be going back more towards Gollum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sam even notes like a change in his eyes. Right. And after all, you know, Gollum's been with him for five days now. Um, and they are finally at the actual, the actual, actual, actual Marsh of Despair. Yeah. Which, that's a name. Yes, and Maybe. Gollum and Smeagol talk to themselves. Yes, at, and this is... Over Frodo as Frodo sleeps. Yes, and with Sam, like, which, the fact that Sam didn't, like, immediately get up and be like, the frick, frack, patty what are you doing? I think he wants to hear him. Probably, yeah. So, so he can, so have, can get a more idea. Well, and also so he can have evidence. I think he's all... I It doesn't really imply it at all. But I wonder if somehow Sam is waiting to see uh, Gollum become an enemy or try to hurt him or try to hurt Frodo. So, yeah, I guess. So he has like, so that his whole thing about like, you know, wanting to kill him is, um, is vindicated. Right, yeah, I'm Sam. Sam hates Gollum so much, he's willing for his master to be bait to prove how bad. Gollum yeah, is. he really is. And then this whole conversation, this is where I got confused because, like I said earlier, right, that up until this point, I was like pretty confident that 
Schmeagle was like the good ish kind of one and Gollum was like the my precious I'll do anything for my precious type of one but in this conversation I I had to read it at least three times because I did get a little get confused um what it seemed to be backwards to me in this conversation where it was Schmeagle who really wanted the ring and Gollum didn't and or they both did but it was like it was like Smeagol was the one being like, "Let's hurt him." Well, it's it's. Or am uh, I just? Did I just? Was I just totally missing like misreading? Because I really well, did read this three times well, trying to understand. You know, well, so remember, Smeagol acquired the ring the very first time through violence. That is true. Yeah. Okay, so that's something to take into consideration. Yeah, where Smeagol, yeah. like he, he was, and which means he was probably prone to violence prior to the ring. If the ring was able to correct, like, get him to do that, like, just like that. Right. And, well, and while it seems that both Schmeagol and Gollum want the ring, it's for, it's kind of for different purposes. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, Gollum wants it because it's his precious. He mm-hmm. can't live without it. Schmeagol sees it as a sign of power. That is true, yes. And that's where, like, later in the chapter, when he, or later in the conversation with himself, where he talks about, like, I can be the great golem, the golem kind of thing. And I was just like, okay, yep. <laughs> let's go, fam. Sure. Right. <laughs> and so in the movie, mm-hmm. in, in the, in the, in a Peter Jackson's movie, when we get to this conversation that he's having with himself, mm-hmm. it's filmed so well. Okay, I'm excited to see it. Don't don't spoil it. Okay. Yeah, I, we'll just we'll get there when we get there. Okay. All right. Uh, but also while Sam is watching Gollum do this, Go- he sees Gollum's fear in him, so Gollum won't even mention the name. Sarah. Yeah. Yeah. He. Yeah. 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 He's he's afraid it, of him. He doesn't want him to get it. He is bad. He is bad. Um, which kind of is interesting because now we have the female son and a male nasty bad guy. Yeah. But he doesn't see either one of them as benevolent. Correct. So I, I find that interesting, where it doesn't seem like he's got, doesn't seem like he has a role model or something that emulates or is an example of goodness. That's very true. It's bad and badder. Yeah. Worse and worser. <laughs> That's exactly how he would talk. Yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> And then, and you know, as, as we as we get to the end of the chapter, you know, Frodo gets a chance to sleep again, and he wakes up refreshed. Actually, after the sleep, yeah, I had another question about this. I couldn't figure out why. Was it just sleep was good in general, or yeah, I, I or think, that they got like a full night's sleep? I, I, I think he <laughs> finally got the sleep he needed. Okay, for one, uh, second. Uh, maybe, maybe he... Does it also seem like he dreamed? Which, was there, like, something in the dream? Is that a thing? No, not here. But also, it seems weird when you think about it that he was comforted that two people were watching over him. I mean, he's... I mean, he trusts... Gollum, much, he much does. more. And Gollum, again, when Gollum was, like, talking, he's just like, the nice hobbitses. And it's like, but it's a Baggins. We hate the Baggins. But this is a nice Baggins. Like, right. I just, I, and again, like, I know, <laughs> I know we discussed this earlier on our Q&A that you're not a big fan of, or Frodo's not your favorite. Frodo is my least favorite Character of the original fellowship. Yes. Um, is what we determined. Um, mine was Aragorn, if you guys need to know that. 
but um for this um where was i going i don't know <laughs> <coughs> but but um but i think this shows that frodo is a lot more trusting a lot more kind he has he's very forgiving and i think that's his strength of character well i i also think that as for him being the ring bearer now he's got an insight into how Gollum got to where Gollum is right yeah oh. and so he's he's you got feel he, the pull of the ring. he's got a little pity there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but when fogo wakes fogo when fogo wakes When Frodo wakes up and is reflect, jeez, I can't talk today. When Frodo wakes up and is refreshed, um, he wants to head out towards the gate. Yes. And I find that interesting. <laughs> and also here we get one more flyover of the Nazgul. Right. And so we definitely know at this point if you if we start putting two to two together um with the nazgul that was seen by the other part of the party and now the nazgul seen being seen here they can't possibly be the same nazgul. right they can't possibly be the same creature yeah so they're probably they might be split up mm -hmm. into singles right now gathering information yeah Especially, doing reconnaissance. Yeah, especially now they're their air power. Yeah. Which we've talked about Tolkien's dislike. Yes. He's fine with reconnaissance, and that was it. That's it, right? And I wonder how he felt about the dam busters. Sorry, that's his whole rabbit hole. Never mind. I was watching a documentary recently on World War II. Please forgive me, everyone. Bust a dam. Um I don't know what move he just attempted, but if you guys could have seen whatever that was, <laughs> you would understand my confusion. Anyway, so you got anything else for the chapter? Yes. Um, I would like to petition the Council of You to get a half a point for the candle thingies. Because it is something they haven't encountered before, and it is somewhat sentient, in my opinion. He's thinking. He's that, thinking. I don't. I don't see them as monsters. I said monsters or creatures. How about a quarter point? I'll take a quarter point. I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll take it. Okay, cool, 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 cool. Um, anything else before we start wrapping up? Um, no, I think that's it. Okay, so the next chapter, again, Tolkien's bad, bad, bad way of spoiling stuff. Okay. It's called The Black Gate is Closed. Um, I'm going to predict that the black gate is closed. Uh, okay. Um, and at this point, I'm not sure. Okay. I'm not sure where we're at in the journey to. Okay. So, hmm, let me think. I'm going to predict that they're not. That they're not even going to attempt to go through the gate. I'm going to predict that they're going to decide before they see the gate is closed not to go through it, to go the back way. Can, it, does that count? Okay, you can say that. Okay. Um. Oh, gosh, I need two more. Oh, my goodness. Um, ma, 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 ma. I think in this chapter... This chapter specifically, so this isn't going to be like an ongoing, like, I think this is going to happen, unless I really think it's going to happen. Um, but for this chapter specifically, I think Gollum's going to make a swipe for the ring. Okay. Um, 
And then, um, um, and then my third prediction is going to be Frodo is going to like hang off a cliff of some type. Or, like, a, 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 he's going to, like, be falling or, like, hanging on for his life for some reason. Okay. I don't know why that popped in my head, but, it like, that's, like, what I was vibing with. So, we'll see if that's a thing or not. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, join us next episode, same token place, same token time, as we continue our <laughs> adventures of... Uh, Lord of the Rings. I've been Evelyn. I've been Robert. This is talking about it. <laughs> See you next time. <laughs>